Thank you very much. It always feels well to have that welcome in the beginning. You never know where it ends up. Um, I remember when I first uh, came here to Australia, that was uh, 1998, and uh, Vision Zero was three and a half years old by that time. We had opened our first um, barrier road, or wire rope, they called it by then, but a flexible barrier road in Sweden, where only 0.3 of the population living in that neighborhood liked the idea. Um, and the motorcycle community in Sweden said, you know, uh, congratulations to Sweden, he's leaving, and feel pity for the Australians. The same magazine three years later wrote when I returned to Sweden, oh no, he's back again. <laughs> That's a little bit um, about how Towards Zero, Vision Zero is, is first seen as something completely uh, insane because it's felt to be impossible. Um, the other thing, it would probably have such an impact on mobility and our daily life. Um, speeds will drop to zero or even below or something like that. So uh, people just feel, you know, it's a big threat. So I think the first thing all the time to do is try to convince people of that it is possible. And the feeling is, if you can show it's possible, people actually like it. Because it has got to do with, as the minister was saying, as something that's very close to us, our relatives' life and health, and, and the wider communities. But it is that really people feel it's the threat. Because we've been educated that it's impossible. Um, but what I will talk a little bit um, here, and, and given this fantastic opportunity, I'm so impressed um, that 288 people come and discuss traffic safety um, the way you do here. Uh, and I know the black market prices of the tickets getting here is just close to $1,000 or something. Um, it's just fantastic to see so many, uh, and many of you are actually um, you're my friends, um, because as I said, I lived here for quite some time. And there's something that's very different from Sweden here, and that is you're not cynical. Um, I suppose you believe you are, but uh, I am a better judge than you are in that sense. <laughs> anyway, um, don't uh, misunderstand, please, my message here. Because what I, my message will be is about that traffic safety shouldn't go alone into the future. Traffic safety and towards zero is a part of something bigger. Um, it's a part of something new. It is a part of innovation. And it's part of something positive that has got to do with with uh, people's life and health, but more so a more pleasing mobility. In the old days, you say, I'm sure you remember that the mobility, whatever you call them, fans or something worse, they were our enemies. For some, even the environmentalists were our enemies. And today, I think we have reached a point where they are not enemies any longer. They are allies in making life much better. And that is what I will be talking about quite a lot, is that we need to integrate our principles because they are accepted. And, and still, I'm, I must admit, I'm surprised that they are so much accepted, especially given sort of the reaction in the beginning. But not only in Sweden and here and in New Zealand and, and here around, but across the whole world, actually more or less. I heard the latest figure was that 43 of the American 51 states have adopted the policy uh, towards zero or like. So I'm not sure they know what it means, but that doesn't matter. But that bigger picture is a little bit um, what I will be talking about. And uh, as I said, don't be afraid now. But I'll go through a little bit the principles behind Vision Zero, because that's going to be this so important that we retain when we are looking at the bigger picture. 
I mean, what has happened over the years is that in the old days, we treated traffic safety as sort of an, an adverse result of mobility, something we should trade off or, or make a balance, I should say, between safety and mobility and the other positive or adverse effects of, of, of uh, mobility. Today, traffic safety, or life and health rather, is a boundary condition for mobility. And for us, that's been working in transport policy, that's a plain revolution. I mean, second to the motorcyclists who shouldn't be afraid of Vision Zero, and, and I shouldn't pick on them in any way. On the contrary, I think they are important to discuss with. But the trickiest people in the whole branch of mobility has been the economists that were so good at modeling those mathematical models of how you deal with safety to mobility. They're good people, and there's probably a couple of them in the room. And you, you, you doesn't have to uh, excuse yourself. Um, it's just that life is quite different nowadays. Now it's a matter of doing things in a cost-efficient way, of course. But it is a boundary condition. We should never forget that. And don't be afraid of taking that discussion. It's also about, as you know, responsibility. We've stopped blame the road user for everything that goes wrong. Road user are not perfect. We are not perfect either. But we don't blame them for all the stupid things we've done in the road transport system because we believe they were perfect or going to be perfect. So we, as a community, it's us that should be responsible. Not for all the behavior out there, of course, but for the outcome. That's, that's very different, of course. We have designed principles and never forget them. Now we have, we have adopted them. It's based on the failing human, not the perfect human. Um, and that's a completely other design that would lead us to. Now, we have already a 100-year-old transport, road transport system. We have to stick what we have. We have to modify it. That's the bad news. The good news is it doesn't cost very much. Sure, it's, it is mon money we need. But it is less costly to save a life today than it was 20 years ago. Because we are much better at it. And we've learned what works and what doesn't work. We've used science instead of beliefs and myths to save lives. We've got plenty of researchers. And you have some of the best in the world here in Australia, in Victoria. I don't say which university that would be <laughs> going too far. Because they're around everywhere, of course. Sorry for that. Um, we shouldn't forget also that, that it's much better to talk about demand for life than restricting people. And I personally think that's true. You don't have to restrict very much, um, except for, as the minister said, some middle-aged or older men that needs to understand things. When we have, and I think we've all that's involved here been talking about sort of how do you go about explaining to people what this is about. And I must say it's, it's, it's tougher to, to talk to the professionals than to the general public normally. Um, but anyway, it's, it's important to have an idea what, what we're talking about when we discuss these issues. And these are more into the, into the professional ones, of course. But going, as you know, upstream, not blaming the victim. As you heard, we've, we've stopped doing that. Going upstream means that we go to organizations, to systems, to understand how we design things, who make decisions in the community. Um, that's sort of what we should be talking about a lot. And we do, of course. We talk about what's an acceptable number of deaths. And um, I've seen the TAC's absolutely brilliant ad about that. And I've heard the story behind, and, and uh, that was fantastic. 
And you're so much better here in Australia to talk to the community than what we are in Sweden. We just do it and then we get all the sort of problems afterwards. That's called the short, long way of dealing with things. Um, we've, we've tried a lot of other things and I know you have as well. And, and as I said, you're probably better at it. Um, but to compare, as you know, things like speed, it's no problem to understand you shouldn't be jumping out of the window here on the 17th floor. We got it built into us. Not even a child six months of age would do that. Now, please don't try, of course, but wouldn't do it. It's built into us. Psychologists have explained to me that that's the way we work. But speed over ground. And, and you know, of course, that we survive on the way down to the ground. It's when we stop that we get killed because we've got a high speed and it's a very short stopping distance. Speed over ground, there's no inherited biological thing in our brain or autonomous nervous system that has got anything to do with speed. That's something we need to learn through our brain. There's no natural speed, no normal speed. There's nothing at all in that sense. It is only what we as a collective can learn about it as something that has got to do with physics. That's why it's very good to you know, don't ask people that question. Now, if, would you really drive over a bridge like the Westgate Bridge if it was three meters wide with no guardrails on each side? in the dark in 100 kilometers per hour, raining and talking on the mobile phone. Well, maybe on a circus or something, yeah. That's the picture we showed. It has worked everywhere, except in New Zealand. They are not afraid of heights there. <laughs> and that one works pretty well as well. That's, the, that's how the urban environment works. That's suddenly turned up now, 20 years later, in, around the world as a, as a nice picture. It shows a little bit of the urban design. Now, it's, once again, we have the sort of basic things. We have a lot of good instruments out there that we can use um, to explain. This one, of course, um, it's, it's human to air. And I won't go through them. We have great models for what we should be doing. We have a fantastic idea about speed limit systems that's actually based on physics, on how cars are designed, how roads are designed, instead of what we believe is a, is a sort of good speed. We can set it on a technical basis, which means good technology, or oh, not good, but more, a little bit more expensive technology, higher speeds. If you don't have that, lower speed. Very easy. Even a middle-aged man can understand that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I don't know who many belongs to that group. Anyway, um, we have a lot of great results we can demonstrate because here it's really what counts is we can go back to the community and say, it works. The new infrastructure design principles like roundabouts, mid-barrier, um, speed reductions through what we do in, in the urban environment and things like that, it works. And it's cheap. Widening a road costs a fortune. Doing the right things to a road for safety reasons doesn't necessarily cost more or less anything. Sure, I, I shouldn't underestimate. There's still a lot to do. That's why it, there is a sort of a cost. And we can't do it overnight. It's simply impossible. But there's great hope. If you put a mid-barrier into a road, the normal thing is that you drop fatalities by 80%. If you can come up with other in countermeasures like that, um, that'll be fine. But it's new speed management principles related to that doesn't mean reduce speed, it means good speed management. We have, when we get to vehicles, um, we have created competition 
on safety instead of regulation, because simply regulation, regulation is important when it comes to vehicles, but it doesn't drive development. It makes sure the sort of more, if I may call it so, lazy ones gets up to date. But competition is what you need to drive development. And if you look at vehicles, I mean, we, we should actually try to get rid of every car that was built before 2005 just now. Uh, if you, in a few years, we'll move that forward as well. Today, a three-year-old car is considered old when we talk about technology. And it was really good three years ago. The tragic thing, we've only used up maybe 10 or 15 percent of the lifetime of the car when the technology is old. You can imagine an iPhone, 25 years old, and say we should still use it. That was a joke. <laughs> we have uh, developed management standards for safety. We've uh, adopted a number of principles. Um, that's really been important. ISO 39001, I know Anders Lee will be touching upon maybe. Um, but there is a management principle for it. That it's not only for agencies and so on, it's for organizations more generally, which is great. Anders has got it there, yep. And we have replaced things like active and passive safety. We have, we have, we've, on our way to get rid of the old silos in traffic safety, there were oh, different safety communities have different views on what you should be doing into what we call integrated safety. That's really great. We work together in the traffic safety community in, in a way we didn't do before, because we understand all of us that we have a role. It's not that we see alternatives. You normally have to do things uh, together. The only thing we all the time talk about is it needs to be scientific. We are in the health business. In the health business, you don't experiment with people. You do things seriously when it comes to saving people's life. We are like the, uh, the hospital, but we treat the patient before he or she is injured. Now the bigger picture. The bigger picture is that the road transport system is not sustainable at all in any respect. It's not even effective when it comes to mobility. People are spending hours sitting in congestion in especially the big cities or around the big business. It is changing our world in terms of climate change because of the greenhouse gases. Um, I'm sure no one here in this room doubts that there is something going on with our climate. Um, that's quite serious, as you know. We have a road transport system that globally kills between one and one and a half million people every year. It's hardly sustainable. It's too noisy. Noise is going to be the the new pollution, as you know. Um, the road transport system takes too much space, and especially in a world where urbanization continue, when we're going to be 9.5 billion people in, in, in some years' f future, and many of them are going to build in, they're going to be in cities, and especially the mega cities where the road transport system normally is between 60 and 65% of the area that's been built in some way, where 25% of the space in the cities is used for parked cars, used 2% of the time, that's the time you use a car. It, it's parked 98% of the time which takes an enormous space. And that's problematic, of course. So, there's so there are so many factors around here where, which shows transport system is not, is not um, sustainable. UN told us, the uh, 
traffic safety, no, transport community in 2004, asked, how on earth, that's a good start, yeah, how on earth could you, transport people, kill 100 million people between 1900 and 2000? 100 million. And you said that you have worked out a perfect equation between the good things of the transport system and the bad things. And how can the transport system be so important in changing our climate and all the other things I mentioned? There's so many things we need to rethink, of course. And, and, and this time, it's serious. So the UN has brought together all countries in the world, as many of you probably are quite aware of. They did it around the millennium and had the millennium goals, and now it's the global goals, or Agenda 2030, which points out with 17 goals and 169 goals under it, so don't get <laughs> too much trouble by that. But for the first time, define what we expect from a transport or a road and a road transport system. And it's, it's not sort of trade off is not mentioned once. It is in absolute terms. It doesn't say safer, it says safe. It doesn't say a little less fossil, it says fossil free. Words that are not relative, they are absolute. This is the way, and the first time in, in history, in the world history, that's expressed by 190 countries. Group. Maybe not all agree, but anyway. By 2030, provide access to safe. Affordable is used for the first time. Very important word, of course. Accessible, sustainable transport system for all. And so on. Fantastic pointing at vulnerable situations and things like that. This is a global goal, and it gets even tougher. Uh, I won't go through them all. By 2020, half the number of global deaths and injuries from road traffic accidents, and the basic year is 2010. That's a little bit tougher than I think that any one of us really can deliver. But anyway, it has been expressed. And as we understand it, it is between 2030 and 2050 that sort of close to zero. EU, the European Union, has said 2050. We should be close to zero, which means roughly halving the road toll every 10 years. So something like that, which we know we can do. We know we can do that. It's getting a little bit more complex, I'm sure, further down the track. The last 10% out there that currently don't survive, I'm sure we haven't got any solution for today. But let's see what we have in 35 years time or something like that. Anyway, it's very clear, I should have that one. It's very, it says other things that's quite important. It says that, uh, that um, companies, especially big companies, should engage very much in creating a better, uh, well, a better transport system as well. And it says we should use also things like pro public procurement. I don't think that's tough here in Europe to use public procurement. It's very complex if you're going to do something, if I may so, something that goes beyond pure economics. As I said then, we have new words in the transport planning. Clean air, for example. What is that? What does secure mean? What safety and security, we shouldn't mix them together all days, but which day would a parent be willing to send the, out their nine-year-old child to school? Certainly people don't do that today, unless they simply have to, because they care for their children. You can't be on the road. You can't cross a road today uh, when you're nine years old. But which day? 
because pe children should move first of all. It's not good for us to sit down. I can, yeah, yeah. Have you heard that? The Australian study is saying for every hour you sit, it is, I think, in front of the TV, Anders has said, you will die 22 minutes earlier. I'm standing up, I should say that. <laughs> that was not a joke. <laughs> There are other words like, you know, uh, compact. We, we must talk about space much more. Once again, it's very ineffective the way we've organized uh, the transport system in terms of space. Once we come to those areas, I mean, not in the countryside, but we would come to areas uh, where it's really starting to be an, an asset that's, that's not there. I mean, and that's going to be a tricky political issue, of course. How do we share the sort of public spaces we have in the future in the best possible way? Um, and that's not so easy. It's going to be a tricky thing. The good news when it comes to creating things is that innovation takes place at a higher rate than, than any time before. Um, what is called Moore's Law or something like that, seems to apply to the whole community, where every 18 months things are have doubled or whatever in terms of performance. It's just fantastic. I remember just before I left Swedish Transport uh, Administration, that's a year ago, and, and I had problem. I was one of the first who got an iPhone at STA. That was in 2009. It was an iPhone 3S. Um, it's in museum now, by the way. Um, and I had problems, so I called our IT apartment, and, and there comes a guy, he was 22 maybe, very clever guy. He picked up my phone, looked at it and said, I've never seen something so old before. <laughs> it tells us something about sort of, you know, um, what's going on in the community. And, and one thing is for sure, an enter or a whole branch that doesn't understand that we are moving from products to service is not likely to survive for a long time. Car industry consider that they are in products. That's maybe a little bit important to understand that they they um, they are a little bit let's say annoyed, not because they don't understand, but because it's not so easy to change a whole such a big part of the economy built up by, by manufacturing and by um, di um, distributing uh, new cars around the world with dealers that live upon it and a lot of things. But the quickest growing part of the market, that's the shared vehicles in one kind or another. I have a system. I, in most big cities of the world, I can find out in seconds if there's a car within five to 10 minutes of reach that I can book immediately, walk out on the street, pick up the car and go away, and then leave it wherever I want. Um, that's, just a very, that's just a starting point. Talking about automation of vehicles, driving, self-driving, and especially driving like a robot, together with electrification, will completely change that whole thing about how we use the car in urban areas, we should say. And not the middle-aged man first. It's going to be, of course, young people who pick up those kinds of ideas. You don't want to own a car, but you want to be able to use a car. But a car today is, as I said, used 2% of the time. Technology is old after three years. It is probably better to use a car 10 times more so you can sort of have a new technology platform within a much shorter period of time. I don't want to be a car manufacturer um, taking decisions now, understanding that I'm going to be what you call a tier two, level two delivery into future mobility if you don't change very quickly. Someone out there with, with the name we either know or don't know is planning to put those kinds of systems out there, maybe within a year or two. And of course, they're going to ask Melbourne as well, can we drive 
cars without a driver in, let's say, 10, 15 kilometers per hour on the back streets of Melbourne because we want them to move to those who is now demanding a car. And in the middle of the night, we will ask if it is possible to deliver some IKEA furniture to some people as well. Be sure it's going to happen very soon. And those are all the things we have now in the future we can use. In summary, towards zero it seems to be, it's established now. To some of us, I mean, Eric Howard and, and others as well, we, we're quite surprised, but yes. We, we, only, we only wish to try, but it worked. It is a one dimension of sustainability. It's not a standalone thing any longer. That's, that's not so good to think in that way. It's a part of other processes. It's not the process on its own. That's a big mistake to believe that. It's, of course, a leadership issue. It is. And we don't work with trade-off. And there are many good old solutions that we will still use. But innovation is really the answer to, to uh, what we should be doing. It's, new, it's not that we should do a new waiting. It's, it's, it's new. And this is uh, a strange little consultant I'm working for in Sweden. Anyway. I just wanted to show it because they get very upset if you don't see it. But don't tell them. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions of Klaus. So if anyone would be interested, please put up your hand. We have, I think, some roving microphones. And also, please just state your name and any affiliation which you might have. Uh, thank you, Professor. And uh, thank you once again for uh, an excellent presentation. Uh, my name is Guy Wilson Brown, a director with Yarra City Council. Uh, as you may be aware, we're about to trial 30 kPa speed limits uh, in the city of Yarra. It's been semi-controversial, it's been in the news, but nonetheless, uh, we're pushing ahead. Uh, I guess I'd be interested in your thoughts of the benefits of 30 kPa speed limits in an inner city environment versus 40 kPa or, or even higher. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that question. It's, it's, it's a really good one. And I, I think we've done a lot of mistakes when we're sort of selling reduced speed limit. I, I think that's the wrong message in the community. I think it's about, I mean, we do it in environments where we wish to have another type of quality. We don't want it dominated by the traffic stream. We want maybe some social interaction to take place. Maybe we wish to reduce noise, um, particle pollutions, um, and we want to wish to increase livability. Those are very important factors, and they are heavily related to speed, um, which I think very many people, of course, understand. But sure, it is a part of changing the environment. You, you no, normally have to do other things when you, you, you sort of bring that in. But I think it's a matter of, and I'm, that's one thing I feel sometimes a little bit disappointed. I think those kinds of changes in the community needs to be carried by many. Because there are many who has interest in that happening. Unfortunately, traffic safety has sort of taken too much of, of those, if you call it, battles. And I don't think we should be doing that mistake in the future. So rename it, talk about qualities instead, and be very clear about which they are. I think that's the best advice, because I think we've done so many mistakes in this area in, in, in Sweden as well. Uh, it's John Lambert. I'm one of those grumpy old men that you keep getting stuck into. Um, I know Torre Larsen very well, and I suppose you do as well. And I visited him in Sweden in September. And I was actually shocked to drive in Sweden because I'd been told that the speed limit's 110 and you don't travel any faster. And I found that, in fact, your freeways aren't built to the high standards that ours are. I found that you also have 120 kilometre hour speed limits. I found the outside lane always travels 20 kilometres an hour faster than the speed limit. Mm. And I found from Torre that you don't get booked till you're doing about 155. 
How does that fit in with your speed management system? Not that good. <laughs> That's why we normally say, it's great when you listen to us, but for God's sake, don't come to Sweden. <laughs> But you're right. Police enforcement in Sweden is non-existent. Um, we have a lot of speed cameras, though. We have 1,200. Though they are built never to catch more than, let's say, 50, 60,000 per year, they're so visible, so you, you, you wonder why someone can be caught by them. But anyway, that's our intention, is that people should see them because they should slow down. I mean, we're not interested to have people's fines um, we're interested in their speed. So when it's really important with sort of low speeds, like on undivided roads, maybe up to 80 kilometers per hour, and where we've got our stretches of, of speed cameras, we've got very good compliance, 1% over the threshold. In the rest of the system, I can promise you, yes, that's very different from Australia. You're so, you've been working so great with this issue here. Uh, we're not proud of that um, at all. But simply, we, we had to work with other kinds of things because we couldn't get there. And once again, police in Sweden, there's nothing wrong with them, but they're not interested in traffic, I can promise you. My name's John Belitho. Um That was a very interesting presentation. Um, one of the issues that you raised was the integrated approach and indicating that this Vision Zero approach ought not cost much. Uh, I come from regional Victoria where we have strip roads that are not even the equivalent of some roads in Zimbabwe, where the capital cost of bringing the system to an acceptable level as you find in the cities is likely to be enormous. I'd just be interested to hear your views as to how government can really find the capital that's required to ensure that the system is actually safe? I mean, I, I touched upon the safety aspect of the infrastructure. Um, there's a principle now being applied more and more in Sweden is that, well, if you can't invest into um, the infrastructure, you need to, to manage the speed. <laughs> speed cameras and things like that, uh, simply to get to a line. But sure, it's problematic in the less populated parts of the country. Um, less and less investments are made to keep up with the infrastructure. And, and people are moving from there, of course, and we, some believe it has got to do with how we treat sort of travel and travel time and things like that in those areas. Um, on the other hand, I personally also get pretty upset when people bring up a number of things like widening roads or paving roads or all sorts, getting rid of curves and things like that and call it safety because it hasn't got anything to do with safety. The safety component of even rural infrastructure is not very complex. It's not very costly at all. In fact, it's very cheap to do the basic things. So my advice is don't, don't mix things up and don't go under the traffic safety hat when it is not traffic safety we are talking about. But to say we don't invest into traffic safety because it's expensive, it's equally also quite upsetting when people are doing. I'm not saying it happens here, but it happens in Sweden. Maybe now I should. Yeah. Could we please join us in thank you.